I've got a big mouth. Let's see if that helps me. As a child, I used to get punished for getting into arguments. Now I get paid to argue. Then you should come spend some time in India. You have no idea. Uh, <laughs> Hello and welcome to News Laundry Interviews. Today we are joined by uh, via Zoom. Mehendi Hassan, I'm sure many of you, our viewers already know who he is. Hi, Mr. Hassan. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you for making the time. Why we are speaking with you is uh, Mr. Hassan's new book, Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading and Public Speaking has just been released. And I must admit, I haven't read it yet. And that is something that I hate doing interviews without reading the book. But these days, the publishers uh, giving you a slot and giving you the book is so close together that it's, it's uh, often well, don't, don't read the chapter on the importance of preparation then. <laughs> it is better to lose an argument and win a friend rather than win an argument and lose a friend. You clearly wouldn't have that poster in your room, right? <laughs> no, no. I, I think such phrases are well-intentioned and well-meaning, but I live in the real world. In the real world, uh, winning arguments can be the difference between getting a job and putting food on the table or not getting a job and putting food on the table it can be the difference between saving democracy where I am in the US or where you are in India. What is your style? And could you tell us why? You're clearly not the gently nudge someone into a direction or, you know, uh, prevail on someone to entertain another thought. You like yeah. go hammer and tongs. You think that's effective in persuading the person or is it effective in persuading the audience? That we forget that in an argument or a debate, especially a formal event, a political event, a TV interview with a newsmaker or person in power, the point isn't to change their mind. The point is to actually have an impact on the minds of your audience. Right. Context matters. When people say, are you trying to achieve this? What is your goal? I say, well, First, tell me where I am. I have different goals depending on where I am. Am I interviewing a person in power or am I arguing with my uncle at the, dinner, at the, you know, at the dining table? Uh, convince uh, our audience that this book could still work, that you can still convince people when they don't want to be convinced because they're ideological, ideologically so committed. First of all, I would say this. Number one, facts still matter. I know that people in your country, my country, in my home country, the UK, want to tell us, especially people on the right, that facts don't matter. The authoritarian needs the public to believe that facts don't matter because that's how the strong man emerges. Um, but the studies that I cite in the book, the polls and, and academic work still shows uh, that facts matter. Do they matter to smaller numbers of people? And one of the stories I tell in the book for your Indian audience, you know, I, I, you know, I talk about how to stop the people who BS who try and steamroll you with nonsense. And as you say, you know, Indian politics and Indian media has become the masters of that. I've experienced that. I had Ram Madhav on my show at the Oxford Union, what was it, seven, eight years ago. And when the interview was over and he stopped shouting and the cameras had stopped rolling, he leaned over to me and he said, ha ha ha, I turned your show into Indian television. You cannot know your own argument unless you know the other side and the most plausible version of the other side's argument. It's very important to be able to frame an argument and reframe an argument. Somebody may throw something at you that you don't agree with the premise of. Feel free to reframe it in a way that makes sense to you and that is going to be easier to make sense to an audience. Do you watch much Indian news? Uh, I used to watch a lot more before I got bogged down. I've been on Indian television. I've interviewed Indian politicians. I've visited India many a time and watched the various cable channels, which make Fox look rather mild. No Western liberal democracy has anything comparable uh, to Fox News, although I refuse to call it Fox yeah, News. To Fox I, I, I saw that of, interview of yours where you refuse to call it news. In it's terms of, it's a right-wing propaganda right. channel, but it's I not agree. just a right-wing propaganda channel. Fox is not a news enterprise. Whatever you think of MSNBC, we are still a journalistic organization. You can, we can make mistakes, yes. We get things wrong, yes. We're only human, but when we do, we try and correct them. And we have standards, we have rules, we have regulations. Tucker Carlson is able to say things that no one else in the media is able to say because they're not true or they're deeply offensive or both. You can hate my views on MSNBC. You can say Mehdi Hassan is wrong about everything. He has horrible views, fine. But know this, when the cameras switch off, I say the same horrible offensive things that you think are horrible offensive in private too. In the UK and in the US, what is similar, what is different in news consumers and in just how news is presented in both countries. Is yes, the US is a very different media climate because of Fox, because of some of the right-wing media outlets here. Uh, the UK is very different in the sense that TV is heavily regulated in the UK. You don't just have the BBC, um, but you also have all TV news channels regulated by a, a regulator called Ofcom, whereas the tabloid press, the newspapers are very vicious and partisan. In the US, it's almost the reverse. The newspapers are very sober, both sides impartial, or at least want to be seen as that, whereas TV is a more raucous affair. And yes, partly that is a result of different media climates. The UK 
uh, France, Germany, Spain, no other Western country I know of. And of course, India's in a different boat slightly, as we mentioned a moment ago. Why you do what you do? I mean, how did you become a journalist? My father's very... Uh, was always interested in politics, like a lot of Indian immigrants. Satanic Verses, Salman Rushdie's novel was being burned in Bradford um, by Muslim communities in the late 80s, early 90s. My father goes and buys a copy of the book and puts it on his bookshelf in prominent view. And friends of ours are like, you're Muslim, why would you have this book? And he said, well, you can't condemn it unless you've read it. So that was the kind of uh, household I grew up in. I'm a Hindu, but clearly a very large section of people in India think Hinduism is what the fringe right of the BJP thinks Hinduism is. So I can, you know, keep arguing. With... You know, I know that I'm not going to go out and say, let's have a Zakir Nayak style debate where I'm going to debate <laughs> whether Islam is true and Hinduism is false. You said to me today, I came with data and facts and logic and evidence, even to an argument about religion. To watch the full unedited interview, you got to log on to newsroundy.com, subscribe and pay to keep news free. Because our subscribers get full access to all our unedited interviews and all paywall content, some of which you might like. So do subscribe and pay to keep news free because when the public pays, the public is served and we don't take ads.